When I hear your new ideas, I'm reminded of that ad. Where's the beef? Yeah. <laughs> One candidate and one large axe. Large blade, huge handle. Using both hands, he holds it. He smiles, and he hurls the blade forward towards the bullseye. It's awkward as all heck. He can't toss it. It's too big. It's lumberjack style, so he holds the end of the handle with one hand and the top almost near the blade with the other hand, and flings his two arms forward. And you can just imagine in some place somewhere, maybe right next to him, his campaign staff is cringing. This is not an axe-tossing kind of guy, and it could all go pretty wrong. After its release, he smiles and snaps his suspenders the lumberjack behind him smiles, too, because he has hit the target. I mean, not the center of the bullseye, but the blade hits the second circle. The lumberjack puts a red flannel onto the candidate, a sign of approval. It's clear that never in his life has he ever worn anything like that, but it doesn't matter today. Woo! The candidate's staff is thinking, wiping their foreheads with their hands. Another candidate is the former vice president of the United States, now in the running to become president. He's the presumed frontrunner, and everyone thinks so, and a large field of Democratic candidates has gotten into the primary. Former governor, many senators, a hero, a failed presidential candidate. But now this VP is having a real race, and he's in New Hampshire mixing it up, including one photo op with a robot. A small robot about half his size, so he has to duck down and shake its metallic hand. A sign on the robot says, Robot for President. A third candidate mixes it up in Manchester, New Hampshire. The obligatory New Hampshire aw shucks campaign thing. Making small talk with men in coats and hats. Talking about local issues. The race for president in 1984 went this way, an axe-hurling Gary Hart, a robot friending former VP Walter Mondale. I would make uh, uh, other cuts, but I would also add something in, in terms of education and science. I have worked this out, but no, yeah, I've worked this out very carefully. I've worked this out carefully, and I have pledged, and I can achieve it, to reduce the Reagan deficits by more than half. A former astronaut, John Glenn. There wasn't a single figure attached to that, except we're going to reduce it by half. I've put out a very specific program. Other people here have here, too. This gentleman that just made that statement here, and I like Fritz, he's a fine man. But when you go before labor and you promise you're going to match foreign governments, subsidy for subsidy. The first feature of 1984 was the pure number of candidates. It hadn't been seen. Mondale, Hart, Glenn. But also, Alan Cranston, senator from California, Ernest Holling, senator from South Carolina, Reuben Askew, governor of Florida, and a Reverend Jesse Jackson of Illinois. That's eight people. But earlier on, there was Jimmy Carter, the former president, and Edward Kennedy, who by 1982 had taken themselves out of the presidential speculation, but were in it before. That's 10 people. And if you count votes at the convention, Thomas Eagleton, the failed 1972 vice presidential candidate, could also be added as he got 18 votes there at the convention. John Rockefeller, the senator of West Virginia, was also talked about. He spent extra money because the TV ads would bleed into the Washington, D.C. market so he could be talked about. James B. Hunt of North Carolina was in the talk. John Brown, the governor of Kentucky, but formerly the chairman of Kentucky Fried Chicken, built Kentucky Fried Chicken into a national franchise. Bill Bradley of New Jersey. Even that young 42-year-old Joe Biden of Delaware got a few mentions. 
and Dale Bumpers of Arkansas and Morris Udall of Arizona were also candidates that media said were eyeing the race to see if they could step in, if their trial balloons could get anywhere. The balloons didn't, so they didn't. So that's eight in the race and 18 in the periphery of the 1984 race. It's not 2020 by any means, but considering this is 1984, it's a worthwhile point to make. There's often a lot of candidates in the scrum. I've made that point before. And in these days, it cost money to run. You know, these candidates could face dire debts. Didn't really have the kind of fundraising. Why in 1984 then would all of these people start running? Well, we think of Reagan now as a powerful president, and even if we disagree with the politics and that he won his race huge. But at this time, the current president made an attractive target. He's only popular in his first year. That's when he got shot. And he had slid an opinion poll since then. He starts 1983 with a 35% approval rating. Right when candidates are deciding whether they want to jump in. And a little earlier, 1984 is one of these years that starts that early race trend. Gallup has him at average 45% in 1982 and 46 in 1983. There had been a recession in 1982, the worst in recent memory. And it came at a time when new programs were introduced. So they were tagged with Reagan. Top profile GOP members like Howard Baker, the leader in the Senate, were recommending public work programs. Gallup said this. Throughout the year 1982, a solid majority of Gallup's residents have taken the position that Reaganomics, the media term for Reagan's economic plans that will be familiar to anyone who lived during that time but may not be as familiar now, will worsen rather than improve their own financial situation. We were organizing a referendum here in western Massachusetts in which we put on the ballot the question of whether or not the United States and the Soviet Union should mutually halt the nuclear arms race. There was a energy behind a new movement that didn't seem to come directly from the political campaigns of one party or another, though it might have been more on one side. Huge crowds, a million people marching in 1982. These folks came a long way. They're, they're, most, they're, they're in a big semicircle here. These folks came all the way from Iowa. How long did it take you folks to get here? 48 hours. Are you glad you came? Okay, now what do the, the general populace out in Iowa feel about nuclear disarmament? Are you a special bunch or is it a lot more than you? A lot more than us. Five busloads are coming here today from Iowa. They're independent of the DNC, who they predictably thought could be at times just as bad as the RNC. The movement was fielding the big numbers, not seen since the late 1960s. Huge protests. Of peace-oriented voters, some 80% thought that war was likely if Reagan was re-elected to the presidency. you got to understand, this is pre-Gorbachev. This is pre-even having any conversations between the Reagan administration and the Soviets. We're still dealing with the policies that Jimmy Carter initiated after the invasion of Afghanistan. No talk. But the votes of the peace movement were split. Harper's in 1984 asked, can the peace groups make a president? Spending money on voter registration drives to try to answer that question, yes. To prepare materials, the Council for a Livable World, and SANE, with 75,000 members. These groups were targeting senators, regardless of party, who had been hawks. They were going after, for instance, Henry Scoop Jackson, a Democrat from Washington. And then... Henry Scoop Jackson's seat was open after he passed away. They tried to influence and got the primary won by a more liberal member. Groups were successful in forcing candidates to debate real issues of freeze, not only if they were for a freeze. Even conservative Ernest Hollings of South Carolina was for a freeze before he started running for president and on the taste of the movement before he'd run for president. He was also sponsor of an alternative plan to Reagan's economic plan, which was liked by deficit deficit hawks. But it's Alan Cranston, the California senator who takes a strong freeze position that the movement liked and his constituents in California liked, and he was betting on his freeze position in those primaries. My first day as president, I'll do two things. First, I'll announce that we will not test or deploy nuclear weapons as long as the Soviets don't. That can be verified, and it will immediately slow down the arms race. Second, I will propose a face-to-face meeting with the Soviet leader. 
in this dangerous time, it's critical we have a president who makes every effort to ease the tensions between our two countries. I will. For president, Alan Cranston. But 50% of peace leaders polled by Harper's were clear about who they wanted. The question is, where will America be four years from now? What is the American future? What kind of America do we want to be? They wanted George McGovern. Yes, George McGovern, the Democratic candidate from 1972, had entered the primaries in 1984. He did so after he lost his Senate seat in South Dakota in 1980 that he had held for 20 years and after his loss for the presidency. Everyone thought after these debacles he'd just retire, but he did an unexpected thing. He hurled himself into the race to push the debate left and to restore some of his own reputation. Vote your conscience, he told voters. He was cheered even by the supporters of the other candidates every time he entered debates in Iowa and New Hampshire. His own supporters still had their 72 McGovern buttons on and wore them as, one journalist said, as if they were Purple Hearts and they had veteran status. I have decided to seek the presidency of the United States, McGovern said. I shall make that effort on a platform of realism and common sense. Fantasy may be good entertainment on the movie screen, It is not good policy for a great nation. The new realism calls for a revival of the old common sense that has guided our greatest leaders since George Washington, who gave this university, he was at George Washington University, its proud name. Proposition 1. There's no longer any alternative to what President Eisenhower described as a peaceful coexistence, except no existence. Proposition 2. The age of intervention in the eternal affairs of small countries is over. Proposition 3. American prosperity and power rest on faithfulness to our founding ideals, including equal rights and equal opportunities. But the peace movement, though they preferred McGovern, thought Mondale would probably win the nomination and that Mondale had the better chance of beating Reagan of any of the Democratic candidates, including McGovern. And not only that, most of the peace movement leaders surveyed by Harper's felt that Reagan would probably win the race anyway. Still, there was a feeling that left-leaning pessimists could be wrong. The 1982 election saw a decrease in his popularity, the midterms. Democrats gained 24 seats. Strategizing. Pundicizing began. Could the Democrats get out their base and defeat this new force in American politics, Ronald Reagan? Could they drive turnout? Could they do something new? Could they reach out and change the things that voters found wrong in 1980? And on that note, around this time, there came a new term. The Atari Democrats. It was a 1983 San Jose Mercury News article who defined this term for smart young congressmen who sought to make the restoration of American business their issue. A 1984 Philadelphia Inquirer article defined the term as a young liberal trying to push the party towards more involvement with high-tech solutions. Times discuss a generation gap which developed in the 1980s between older liberals who maintained an interest in traditional visions of social liberalism and Achari Democrats who attempted to find a middle ground. There is a strong anti-government feeling out there. And I fundamentally disagree with Ronald Reagan when he says he loves his country and yet he hates our government. I don't hate our government. I think we ought, we ought to have leaders that ask people what they can do for their country using the best instruments of our government. Who was the Atari Democrat in this race? And you'd have to say Gary Hart, though he was a a little unique in a lot of respect. Denver lawyer who took on a popular GOP incumbent in Colorado, a state that Reagan would win handily, a state that voted for Gerald Ford in 76. And he, as a Democrat, beat him. Then he won his re-election in a state where Reagan carried. He was quirky. He was from the West. He had been George McGovern's campaign manager in 72. And there got some press, hung out with Hunter Thompson, hung out with Warren Beatty, other movie stars. He was also quiet. And friends said he was full of ideas. And another thing, he just didn't seem to like reporters very much.
Here's what uh, Richard Ben Kramer said in his excellent What It Takes from 1988, great book about the presidential race. Heard it served two terms in the Senate, yet only one senator, that well-known flaco Chris Dodd, backed him in the 84 campaign. Hart never expected reporters to admire him, just do their job. Was that too much to ask? Of course, he didn't understand their job. He didn't understand why they wrote the same things over and over again. It wasn't anything he said to them. Who were they talking to? E.J. Dion in the New York Times began his dispatch from Ottawa, Oklahoma. Gary Hart came home, and for a moment, he nearly cried. Time magazine crabbed the first two visits in American Notes and dispensed with any facts about the trip to the later paragraph. In his quest for the presidency, Gary Hart is plagued by two troublesome perceptions, that he is cold and aloof, and that he has tried to reinvent or run away from his roots. Paul Taylor in the Washington Post led about the family, Gary Hart's family, 16 houses. It was one of many morsels of biographical detail to emerge from a campaign visit that seemed programmed to unearth three reporters, three big publications, but one common element, his reputation or troubling perceptions. And if you talk to the reporters on the bus, they would just say, everybody knew Hart was weird. One day with his press aide, Sweeney, he said, I'm not going to pose. I know, I know, Sweeney said quickly, but it's only going to be 20 minutes. I don't care. I'm not going to pose. Sweeney was now panicky. He tried to keep it his joke, keep it light. I know, I know, it's only going to be 15 minutes. Hart was staring at him now. I don't think you're listening, he said it with precision. I'm not going to pose. I'm not going to pose. Then a quick pause to see if that had sunk in. I have got to run for president on my own terms. If I don't, I won't be a good president. I probably won't even be president. Look, I'm not going to hide from the press. Those people want to come in here right now and take pictures of you and me talking. That's fine. But I am not going to look at the camera and smile for more than 30 seconds. Because I feel cheap. Hart wanted to run on his policies. He had written a book. He had new ideas. He wanted to separate himself from old ideologies. As early as the 1970s, Hart recalled, a few of us were forecasting about the globalization and the shift of the economic base from Detroit to Silicon Valley that was going to have a huge impact on our country. Although he ran his opponent, George McGovern's campaign back in 1972, Here, 12 years later, he saw that 1972 loss as a teaching moment, teaching him not to be so liberal on the issues, to consider free market solutions, to consider high tech as changing the whole discussion. Yet for all these statements, Hart wasn't in the initial conversation. He only had 1% of the polls in the early going and little recognition. He decided to concentrate his time. He campaigned early in New Hampshire, unprecedented for 1984. Senator Gary Hart. I'm a Democrat and proud of it, but I'm also a Westerner and fiercely independent. The Washington insiders and special interests have handpicked their candidate for president, but I offer our party and our country a choice. With a September swing through the state in 1983, months before the voting, it was possible, despite his little secret campaigning and his ideas, it was possible he could be eclipsed. And so could the former vice president because of a big presence in the race and one who had something new that no one else had behind them. A movie. This is the story of the special few at the very top. The elite brotherhood whose achievements inspired a nation and captured the imagination of the world. These are the men who had the right stuff. They all want to see Buck Rogers, and that's us. John Glenn's story was about to be told on the big screen. The Right Stuff, a movie adapted from Tom Wolfe's best-selling 1979 book of the same name, about the Navy, Marine, and Air Force test pilots who were involved in aeronautical research at Edwards Air Force Base, California, as well as the Mercury 7, the seven military pilots who were selected to be astronauts 
for Project Mercury, the first manned spaceflight by the United States. Glenn was one of those pilots. And a big hit at the box office could get Glenn, who was popular as a senator from Ohio, and who kept a moderate record on defense, who won his state of Ohio, even though Reagan won it, who drove the peace next crazy. 55% of the people that voted for Reagan also voted for Glenn. But it's not to say that Glenn had it made. He gave a bad speech at the 1976 convention when Jimmy Carter was nominated and delegates and TV viewers and pundits noticed. He was good in small groups. and He had great name recognition and high positive rankings. He was really an American hero. But he was dull. Columnist Dave Barry said, he couldn't electrify a fish tank if he threw a toaster into it. But forget all that. There were high hopes. And when the right stuff had its world premiere on October 16th, 1983 at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. to benefit the American Film Institute, what a big event. It was given a limited release October 21st, 1983 in 229 theaters and grossed $1.6 million on its opening weekend. It was pretty big. This is one year before voting's going to begin for the next president, and you've got a movie about your life. But there was an issue. The Right Stuff was not a very good movie. Here's what uh, John Glenn said about it years later in his memoir. Tom Wolfe's best-selling book was good, but what Hollywood did to it could only have been titled Laurel and Hardy Go to Space. Glenn, like the movie, bombed. He came in not second to Mondale and I were, not even third, but fifth. Alan Cranston, Gary Hart, and George McGovern beat the famous astronaut in the Iowa caucuses. Iowa was never about celebrity. Glenn had spent $1.2 million there. That was in those days a lot of money. Did a huge barrage of TV commercials, both in New Hampshire and Iowa. But Glenn didn't get it. Iowa and New Hampshire were not about celebrity, not about TV ads. Glenn wasn't around. And when he was, he wasn't captivating Iowans. Dozens of people wanted an event with Glenn, and they could never get a return call from his office. VP Mondale captured the most delegates in Iowa. He had the best organization, 48%. And that, in a lot of years, would have been a score if it had been any other year. But the surprise of the Iowa caucus was that Hart came in second. It was only 17% of the vote, and less than half the delegates got. 4% more than what George McGovern would get. But it was still second place. And media coverage followed this new candidate from nowhere, Gary Hart. Gary Hart went to New Hampshire and played down his performance in Iowa. Actually, he said there was no chance he was going to win the state, and he guessed he'd come in third and then go south and see what would happen. The reality is he had spent a lot of time there, not always posing as a lumberjack, but doing a lot of other local events. Four days before the New Hampshire voters would vote, students at Manchester High School aggressively questioned the former vice president about his ties to unions and why he promised everything to everyone, all of those special interests. Mondale said his hands weren't tied to anyone, but only half of Democrats in a poll believed him. Reporters also spoke of a passion gap. Democrats voted for him, but didn't want him to win, really. He had a vast organization in New Hampshire, 1,000 volunteers, 31 paid staff. He reached two-thirds of the electorate by phone in pre-primary phoning. And happy with this, Walter Mondale leaves the state of New Hampshire two days before the primary. It was a fatal mistake. Gary Hart not only did better than he had in Iowa, but he won the New Hampshire primary. Just in case you missed them, we showed you a moment ago with Gary Hart taking a commanding lead now with almost all of the precincts reporting in from New Hampshire. That was uh, 91% of the precincts reporting in. That uh, gives, of course, the overwhelming victory tonight to Gary Hart, which, as we noted, was a stunning and overwhelming uh, landslide for uh, Mr. Hart, the senator from Colorado, who, uh, Cheryl, as you know, was the former 
campaign advisor to George McGovern in his last campaign for President of the United States. While Mondale's staff reminded voters to vote, Hart's people were saying, we believe Mondale's people turned out some of our people. They took the reminder and voted for Hart. It was a disaster for the former vice president. Here's how the New York Times reads it. Gary Hart won the New Hampshire primary today in a startling upset that damaged the aura of invincibility with which Walter F. Mondale began the campaign year. Senator Hart, a self-described long shot from Colorado, made rapid gains in the last few days to finish substantially ahead of the former vice president in the Democratic contest. John Glenn was in third place, well behind Mr. Mondale, in a primary that maintained the reputation of New Hampshire voters for using the first primary of the season to reorder the rankings in presidential contests. Mr. Mondale saying, Sometimes a cold shower is good for you. Conceded defeat shortly after 8 p.m., as early returns in surveys showed Mr. Hart leading him among independent voters, who were allowed to vote in either party's primary, and who turned out in heavy numbers, and about even among the regular Democrats who were supposed to make up Mr. Mondale's base of support. So just to take a little perspective from that, Reagan's not running opposed at all in the 1984 primary. He's popular among Republicans. That's just not going to happen. New Hampshire allows Republicans to vote in the Democratic Party primary if they so choose to. The ones that are going to tend to do that, we're going to be the more moderate Republicans that care. Hart was winning handily among those people, and he was about even among people who were just Democrats in New Hampshire. Referring to his Iowa win, Mondale tried to put the best spin on it. I've now won one and lost one. Mr. Mondale told reporters at a Logan Airport in Boston, referring to his victory in the Iowa caucuses, my campaign begins tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Trailing the top three candidates were Reverend Jesse Jackson, the civil rights leader, George McGovern, Ernest Hollings, Alan Cranston, Ruben Askew. Hart wins with 41% of the vote. 29,843 people versus 28,000, uh, 28% for Mondale and 12% for Glenn. Ruben Askew and Ernest Hollings and Alan Cranston immediately get out of the race. Senator Glenn does not. He sounded this note in saying that the Mondale defeat opens up things tremendously because it overturned the conventional wisdom that Mr. Mondale was unstoppable because of his powerful organization and his support from organized labor and party leaders. As far as Mondale, Glenn said, I think that pricks that balloon of inevitability that they were trying to build up. Good spin. Mondale was on the ropes. He had his problem. Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House, in some ways the leader, says he's in trouble. Mario Cuomo, significant uh, but new New York governor at this time, thought that Hart was on a streak. Gary Hart was smart, so he knew he wasn't really the front runner after this, even though he ran well in the first primary. But he did try to set up the race in historic terms. This is a future past race, not a left-right race. That's what 32 was. That's what 60 was, Gary Hart says. The voters thought they got that in 76, a future past rate race. And they thought they got that in 1980. And I think there's a desire for somebody who expresses that latent idealism in America. Ouch. Gary Hart was swiping not only at Reagan, but also his party's former president, Jimmy Carter. The other candidates in the race tried to stay in any way they could. McGovern stays in the race. He jokes that he probably trained Gary Hart too well. Jesse Jackson now attacks the two front runners, saying that Hart and Mondale are exactly the same. They're going to cut government just like Reagan is, just slower. McGovern tries to hold to one state, the Massachusetts primary. It was the one state along with D.C. that he won in 1972. And he thinks maybe he can win that primary. Vote your conscience, he says to Massachusetts voters. They probably did vote their conscience. But they didn't vote for McGovern. Political experts said my campaign of new ideas couldn't win in New Hampshire. But we did. And the debate about America's future continues. Gary Hart. Now they say Southerners aren't ready for new ideas. I don't agree. On March 13th, Hart wins Massachusetts along with Rhode Island. Mondale saves a little face by winning Alabama and Georgia. But Hart, who was written off in Florida some months ago, now took most of Governor Ruben Askew's vote and won the state by six points. Add to this previous caucuses in Wyoming and Vermont that Hart wins easily. Once the underdog and the upstart, now he's in it for real. There's talk now, wait a second, 
Hart could actually win this. There's talk now, wait a second, Hart is actually the front runner and Mondale is the underdog. And it got to the point where Mondale's aides wanted to argue with the press, look, our wins are ahead of us. Stop talking about momentum. We've got the institutional support. Gary Hart's campaign is 300000 in debt. He's not even registered in all of these states in a proper way. The most awesome, powerful responsibility in the world lies in the hand that picks up this phone. The idea of an unsure, unsteady, untested hand is something to really think about. This is the issue of our times. On March 20th, vote as if the future of the world is at stake. Mondale, this president will know what he's doing. And that's the difference between Gary Hart and Walter Mondale. Meanwhile, Hart's campaign is arguing, hey, you're saying you're Mr. Institutional Support. My fundraising guy just went into a uh, uh, went to a meeting with the Fat Cats and were, was pledged a million dollars. Mondale kind of likes this. His campaign calls him Fighting Fritz. And what he'll say during several times during this campaign, that he's starting fresh and starting anew. Iron, Thunder, Dragon, and Redwood. These are the Secret Service names for the candidates of 1984. John Glenn is Iron. Jesse Jackson, Thunder. Walter Mondale, Dragon. And Gary Hart, Redwood. But after his one Southern win, you know, you're you're now getting to the point where Hart's criticizing Mondale as an old-fashioned Great Society Democrat who symbolized the failed policies of the past and positions himself as a younger, fresher, more moderate. He can appeal to younger voters. He can appeal to Republicans. Reagan's afraid of him. Early uh, March poll shows Hart beating Reagan 50 to 41. Still, there was a challenge. Mondale had financial and organizational advantages. And indeed, in primaries, Mondale's going to win Michigan, his home state of Minnesota, and Illinois. But every time Mondale does something good, there's also good news for Hart. Hart wins Connecticut. Journalists are starting to look into Hart a little bit more now that he's a front runner. You know, as Richard Brendan Kramer talked about in his book, there's just a lot of people in the press pool who thought, this guy's strange. Gail Sheehy at Vanity Fair starts looking into his roots, and he comes from Ottawa, Oklahoma. He was born into a family of fundamentalists. He was very sheltered. And eventually he does get away from his family. And some friends think that Hart did everything he could to kind of bury his past. He changes his name from Hart Pence, his original name, to Hart. Later in July, uh, she he's going to find that Hart has a spiritual advisor, Native American spiritual advisor. And in order to boost his positive thinking, to boost his morale, he has a ceremony where he's rubbed with feathers. <laughs> You're just starting to see journalists get on the target for him. Here's what Ben Kramer says. When you talk about the PAC, you have to mention the leader of the PAC, David Broder, who had already attained the status by 30 years, years work as a Washington reporter and lately as columnist for the Post. He was the biggest of the big feet, balding, bespectacled, soft-spoken, fi- kindly, a thoroughgoing gentleman, well-informed, hardworking, fair-minded, and in general, exemplary, which is exactly the point. Broder wrote the book called Behind the Front Page, and the very first story in that book was about campaigns, how mistakes and coverage are made, specifically the story about 1972 when Ed Muskie cried or didn't cry one day in Manchester, New Hampshire, and his campaign slid after that. Part of the story was missed, Broder said, because no one knew until the next year that the whole scenario was launched by a Nixon campaign dirty trick. But at the same time, Broder defended the coverage, which concentrated on the crying by the way Muskie came apart at the seams. Why was it right? Why was Broder so sure? Because everybody knew that Muskie was wound too tight. The guy was weird. All of us suspected that under the calm, placid, reflective face that Muskie liked to show to the world, there was a volcano waiting to erupt. And so he treated Manchester like a political Mount St. Helens explosion, and in our perception, an event that would permanently alter the shape of Mount Muskie. One of the reporters that Broder commended in that instance was Jack Germont, who then worked for Gannett. 
and who wrote a syndicated column with his partner, Jules Whitcover. And the two were the only other snowshoe-sized big feet who actually worked on the trail. Their column ran in hundreds of papers, and it was read religiously by the wise guy community. And where Broder would stray at times into the thin air of government, Germond and Whitcover wrote Pure Politics, a column you could count on. And with their book every four years settling the record and the scores on the last race, they too were exemplary, the ranking diarist of presidential politics. The way they cranked out books, you didn't have to wait 15 years to find out. It was all in their 1984 book, the candidly titled Wake Us Up When It's Over. The name thing, the age thing, the signature thing. Hart changed his penmanship. Jesus. And you didn't even have to wait for the new book because Jules would tell you. They had this dinner with Hartsey in Boston, and it was going great until they asked him about the name thing, or the age thing, or some goddamn thing, and Hart just stood up and walked out. The guy is a weird duck. Yet Hart had something going for him in 1984, and that was electability. We talked about the polls. He was making that argument to potential delegates, to those who had of his fellow senators who had not supported him, to those House members who would vote as superdelegates in the primary, a new thing during this time. That argument held sway in a lot of the parts of the country where the Democrats there particularly didn't like Reagan. It... 1984 sees a fast-paced primary, sees very quick, and a lot of debates. Where's the beef? And it's during one of the debates where Mondale comes up with an idea to try to combat this idea that he's an old-deal Democrat and Hart's got new ideas. But I think there is a fundamental difference, for example, between Vice President Mondale and myself. That is, I think we can, we can meet the basic human needs and commitments of the people of this country by restoring entrepreneurship, 90% of the new jobs in this society have come from small businesses, and I think the, the dedication of the Democratic Party to minority people in the South and elsewhere shouldn't just be jobs. It should be the opportunity to own and operate businesses that create jobs. Mr. Glenn, may I respond to that? Well, we'll, get we'll come back to you. Let some of the others know about coming out from entrepreneurs. You know, when I when I hear when I hear when I hear when I hear your new ideas, I'm reminded of that ad. Where's the beef? Yeah. If you let's keep going, you know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's going to tell you where the beef is, or the roll, or something. Fritz, if you'd listen just a minute, I think you'd hear. No, you haven't. Wendy's had aired this commercial in 1984 that featured an older woman looking at a hamburger bun that was oversized with a very, very small patty and saying, you know, where's the beef? It certainly is a big bun. It's a very big bun. Big fluffy bun. It's a very big fluffy bun. Where's the beef? It would have even been better if Mondale had ever seen that commercial. He had never seen it, so his emphasis wasn't the same as the voice in the commercial. But his consultant, Pat Cadell, did. The remark drew laughter and applause from the audience. It, caught, it catches Hart off guard. He never fully recovers. He's trying to say, well, my ideas are all good. They're in a book, and indeed he had written a book. But the perception now is that some of Hart's ideas are shallow and lacking in specifics. However, uh, the way that you'll ever, if you see anyone talking about 1984 at all, the way that they're going to talk about it is that Hart was defeated here. And that's really not true. Uh, he was hurt, but not out. Jesse Jackson then wins D.C. He wins the Louisiana and Mississippi primaries. This is big because two things. One, it's the first uh, black presidential candidate to win states in a primary. And Jesse Jackson is opening the door for others. Secondly, he's taking states away from Mondale because otherwise it's not likely that those two states would have went to heart. Mondale wins New York, big state and Pennsylvania. And those are important victories. But once again, there's still good news for Hart. He wins Indiana and Ohio and wasn't expected to do so. And things are getting testy as you get into what's called Super Tuesday 3. There's Super Tuesday 1, where uh, Massachusetts was won by Gary Hart in Florida, a big deal. And then there's Super Tuesday 2 with New York. Super Tuesday 3 the big states are New Jersey and California. The smaller states, New Mexico, others. But the big states are New Jersey and California, and both candidates want it. Things are now getting a little nasty. When 
President Reagan sent our troops to Central America, he called them advisors. Remember Vietnam? Our troops now serve as bodyguards to dictators and are a slow-burning fuse to war. Vice President Mondale agrees with President Reagan and said he too would leave some of the troops there as bargaining chips with Nicaragua. And he attacks Gary Hart for forcefully saying, get them out. Our sons as bargaining chips. Will we never learn? Gary Hart. During the debate in Los Angeles, Mondale glares at Hart. He's attacked Hart now for having no ideas. Hart keeps attacking him for having ties to labor unions and political action committees. Mondale glares at Hart and repeatedly objected to the senator's suggestion that the Justice Department may investigate the labor-supported PAC funds that helped elect many Mondale delegates. NBC moderator Tom Brokaw asks Hart, Do you want to look him in the eye and say that you didn't just accuse him of criminal activity? Hart says, He knows I didn't. Mondale says, Did you not suggest a possible judicial investigation? Hart says, I said that the Reagan Justice Department would be very likely to do that, Mundell said. Now, what do you think that suggests? Overparking? I never said anything about criminal. Moments later, Hart accused Mondale of running a campaign of distortion and distraction. Why do you run those ads that suggest that I'm out trying to kill kids when you know better? I'm a person who believes in peace. To run ads as you run them suggest there's something about my policies that will lead to the death of American boys, I think you ought to pull those ads down this, this tonight. This will be crucial tonight. to this election. Yeah. Because I would answer by asking you a question. Why have you questioned my commitment to arms control and civil rights when you know that I have just as much commitment to both of those as you do? The ads illustrate a point. Like two bloody fighters, it looked like one of these, heart with the momentum, winning the western states that everyone knew would be needed by Democrats if they were to defeat Reagan, the new population booming states where Republicans were winning, Mondale with the organization's strength. One of them would prevail just by doing a little bit better, maybe one extra punch. And you throw into this mix then the superdelegates. The Democrats in their 1982 convention had decided to change the rules. And this would give a vote to party leaders, this would give a vote to members of the House, this would give a vote to those on Capitol Hill. So you actually have Mondale, and to some degree Hart, campaigning in Capitol Hill, sort of, to, or calling people to try to get votes there. Because there are delegates there, just as there are in any primary. However, though Mondale has an advantage here, Gary Hart keeps maintaining that all of these superdelegates that had previously announced their support for Mondale were not... You know, those aren't votes for Mondale. That's just an announcement of support. And if he swept Super Tuesday 3, they would all switch to him. This is an argument that we heard in 2016, right? I think with Bernie Sanders when Hillary was trying to claim I have the support of the superdelegates. He said, well, those votes can change at the convention. Mondale knew that the superdelegates would bail him out. But he still had to win something here. You know, among these five states, South Dakota, New Mexico, West Virginia, California, and New Jersey. He couldn't lose all of them, that's for sure. And the Times says, Mr. Mondale cannot afford to go into the convention limping. He cannot afford to get wiped out on June 5th, where five states hold primaries. That's because Hart and Jackson could challenge the superdelegates at the convention or appeal to superdelegates that they had the popular support, that they had the momentum, that Hart, for instance, could take it to Reagan. In the end, it's the California and New Jersey primaries that do it. Hart sends his wife, Lee, to California, where he thought that he'd probably win. And he went to New Jersey to campaign. Now, I come from New Jersey, and I can attest to the fact that it has to be a real dog-eat-dog primary for New Jersey to matter because it's in June. Uh, It did matter uh, in certain years. Uh, A couple of recent ones it has, 2008 and 2016. It's been important. But in uh, 1984's primaries, it turned out to be decisive. Hartz had an issue He complained in a joke to the press that he had to go to New Jersey while his wife got to go to California. That didn't go over very well. And then he made a joke about toxic sludge. Not a good topic. Still, in the voting results, Mondale is disappointed again. And it's only through clever political mechanisms and a kind of sleepless campaign that he's able to even 
eke out anything from Super Tuesday 3. Let me read you what Time says. For weeks, Walter Mondale had predicted with facetious precision that he would acquire the magic number of 1,967 delegates needed to pin down the Democratic presidential nomination at 11.59 a.m. on the day after Super Tuesday 3, the final day of one of the most grueling, frenetic, and unpredictable primary seasons ever. Now on Election Eve, Mondale's campaign was over California, nearing the end of a 25-hour, 5,620-mile coast-to-coast blitz. The candidate had been in fine fiddle, rousing partisan audiences in New Jersey, West Virginia, and New Mexico. He seemed to somehow be thriving on the hectic pace. Finally confident that the elusive goal was in hand, the Minnesotan staff broke out bottles and let spirits soar. The former vice president gleefully awarded T-shirts imprinted with I Survived Air Mondale to members of the press and campaign staff who had made the trip. Waiting out elections in his home state, Mondale heard nothing shake his buoyant mood. His foe Gary Hart was carrying South Dakota and New Mexico, as expected, but delegates were at stake. Mondale was sweeping West Virginia. The news in New Jersey was dazzling. A hefty 107 delegates were the prize. And Mondale, capitalizing on the state's district election system, seemed to be taking an amazing amount of them to Hart's none and Jesse Jackson's four. The voting booths had closed in California with its enticing 306 delegates. But early exit polls indicated a tight race, so it wasn't clear. So Hart here gets two little states, loses West Virginia, loses New Jersey. Mondale's team goes into action. Arriving at a party in St. Paul's Radisson Plaza, Mondale reached out to his rivals and their backers. I want your support, he said. I intend to earn it. Then delivers a satchel page warning to Ronald Reagan. Don't look back. Somebody's gaining on you. He ordered a batch of cheeseburgers, celebrated with friends in his 17th floor suite, and drifted off into a long-awaited deep sleep. But for Mondale's aides, the euphoria gave way almost immediately to a bout of heart-induced nightmares. Back in February, the Colorado Center's stunning upset in the New Hampshire primary shattered the notion that the invincible Mondale machine would crush opposition early. After a string of hard wins in New England, Mondale doggedly fought his way back. Early on Wednesday morning, Mondale strategists found the reports from California turning sour. At 3 a.m., Mondale campaign coordinator Tom Donnellan was awakened by one of the staff's delegate counters. The news from California was dismaying. Hart was headed for a remarkable victory in the state. In the end, Hart won 32 of California's 45 congressional districts. Mondale only 9, Jackson 4. That translated into a nearly 3-1 to one Hart victory over Mondale in delegates. 205 to 72, with Jackson getting 29. The acute problem was to avoid the debacle of Mondale having to confess at his 1159 press conference that despite his boastful prediction, he did not have the 1967 delegates he needed after all. At 7.30 a.m., aides began contacting uncommitted delegates, most of them elected Democratic officials and regional party leaders, to ask them to stand by for a call for Mondale. This was dubbed the phone primary. The candidate, refreshed and unshaken by the reports from California, turned on his powers of persuasion. He made some 50 telephone calls, reaching party luminaries such as Atlanta Mayor Andrew Young, New Jersey Senator Frank Lautenberg, and Alabama Governor George Wallace. The unstated threat, Mondale was certain to win, and late arrivals on the bedwagon were less likely to be remembered favorably by the candidate about 40 of the 50 recipients of the Mondale message took it seriously enough to join him right then and there. That, by the reckoning of the Mondale aides, despite the disaster in California, put their boss over the top. He had gone into the final day of primaries, 225 delegates short of a convention majority, and picked up 201 in those primaries. The time difference on the Pacific Coast had blunted the impact of California. Most TV viewers had gone to bed, like Mondale, with the expectation that the nomination fight had ended. In the most of the U.S., the next day's morning newspapers conveyed the same impression. And Mondale had no intention of having them think anything different. 
Hart hoped to use his California victory to block the Mondale bandwagon, but he was slow to capitalize on it, mainly because he had been caught off guard by the magnitude of his win. Last day of campaigning had gone dismally. His weariness, he was so tired in New Jersey that he praised a supporter for coming here to the New Hampshire primary when he was in New Jersey. Early exit polls indicated he was going to lose the state. After he took off from Philadelphia, an engine caught fire and the cabin filled with smoke. Hart's wife, Lee, ran from a rear seat through the plane because I thought we were going down and I wanted to be with my family. The aircraft landed safely and Hart's shaken entourage took Ozark Airlines to St. Louis in California. He canceled election night interviews in Los Angeles, not knowing that he was on the way to a dramatic and offsetting win. NBC had promoted its scheduled interview with Hart on the nightly news. Could have been a big audience. Correspondent Roger Mudd put questions to an empty chair. A bit of low-blow journalism that enraged the candidate when he heard about it later. At 11.59, as cameramen and aides counted off the seconds, 9, 8, Seven, Mondale strode out to the microphones in the Radisson Plaza and declared, Today I am pleased to claim victory. I am the nominee. I've got the votes. He cited a precise number of delegates behind him, 2008. Mondale pledged to work for a unified convention, saying that he would make personal appeals to both Hart and Jackson to join him in that effort. He conceded under questioning that the friction among candidates had been great, but he tried to downplay it. Oliver Henkel, Hart's campaign manager, insisted that Mondale's claims of delegates bravado. He's still in the 1800s, by our best counts. The news media agrees with Mondale's counts. UPI, considered a reliable count, placed him at 1969. Two more than needed. More delegates, certainly, than Hart and Jackson. Hart will need superdelegates to win, and Jackson would need a miracle, someone getting out of the race and giving him support. Finally, the next day, Hart was able to say, welcome to overtime, and declare that his campaign must go forward and will. If Hart could keep Mondale from a first ballot win, the delegates might desert Mondale in droves. Bruised, Hart, and Jesse Jackson as well go to San Francisco, hoping for a say on the platform, a pick for vice president. bound by our faith in a mighty God with genuine respect and love for our country and inheriting the legacy of a great party. The Democratic Party, which is the best hope for redirecting our nation on a more humane, just, and peaceful course. This is not a perfect party. We are not a perfect people, yet we are called uh, to a perfect mission. Vice President had already stated that he was going to pick either a woman or an African American. Tom Bradley, the mayor of Los Angeles, was getting a lot of attention, as was the mayor of San Francisco, Diane Feinstein, and Geraldine Ferraro of New York, who Hart also had met with, and who Ferraro also liked, though she was backing Mondale. There was a little platform trouble. One of the, the issues that's going to come up is there's a platform piece about a Democratic proposal to require a certain amount of American parts be made in cars. And Gary Hart objects because it's injurious to free trade. And so they just encourage foreign manufacturers to make as many parts as possible in the United States. And that's all that gets in the platform. If Hart has any hopes in the convention, he's assaged by a meeting with Ted Kennedy, who helps broker a smooth convention so the party could take on Reagan. He gets out of this some favorable delegate rules that would leave him in a good position for 1988, when he will indeed enter that race as the front runner. As for 1984 and the Democratic Party, it was all for naught. Here's what Gallup says. By 1984, Reagan's job approvals were consistently above the 50% line. That's a symbolic standard for an incumbent president seeking re-election. In Gallup's last October poll before the November 1984 election, Reagan received a 58% job approval rating. Mondale would suffer an election loss, even worse than George McGovern's. But was it so bad? 1984 saw history. 
the first significant black presidential candidate in a major party to win states in primaries, first woman vice presidential candidate of a major party, a party dealing with its nominating issues and factions, creating and using superdelegate rules that exist in some form today and are still debated about today. Electability becomes an issue. It's tried, but it can't beat poor voters and special interests. Electability gets its first real challenge in primaries in 1984, and it's shown to be a difficult argument. Why? couple of reasons. One is primaries, of course. You're fighting over people who have core beliefs in the party. They're the people that actually vote in those primaries. are going to be less than the general electorate. It's just hard to get everybody out to vote on primary day, except for the faithful. Electability is hard to prove. You're proving a hypothetical. Everyone can say they're electable. And there were great differences between the Gallup polls that would put Hart versus Reagan and Mondale versus Reagan. In March, it's really clear. By the time you're getting to May, some of the polls are showing Reagan's actually beating Hart by one point, maybe beating Mondale by a little more, but nothing significant. And for electability considerations, if they're even going to work in a primary at all, it seems like it would have to be overwhelming. There's another reason, too, and that is that groups like labor unions, once committed to a candidate, have to show the support for the candidate in order to prove that they have value for future contests where they want to trade and negotiate with candidates for perhaps favorable legislation they want. So labor in 1984 has to support Mondale as much as it can. It can't change because they really want to defeat Reagan. It's not in their immediate organizational interest to do so. And that that could be true of many types of special interests. Mondale wins only his home state, in the election of 1984. There's not even much of a significant campaign. The picking of Geraldine Ferraro and the San Francisco Convention is probably the big moment. Mario Cuomo's speech, a big moment. Walter Mondale does well in the first debate with Reagan. Reagan brushes it off in the next debate, and there's not much of an election after that. Mondale makes the point that his election may have changed uh, despite losing that um, the peace issue was brought up, that uh, perhaps he's pushing Reagan slightly to the left and and, and by bringing up the peace issue. We know from uh, the Reagan podcast I did that Reagan had on his mind a desire to talk to the Soviets, for one, and to perhaps get rid of nuclear weapons as much as possible without needing any political push. Gary Hart remains the front runner. He has something like 50% in the polls of of anybody running for the 1988. But a few things happen. One is that reporters are continuing to track him down and continuing to come up with stories about this enigmatic person. And Hart just becomes more reclusive and more reclusive and resists some of the profile stories that magazines and people want to do. When one of his press aides, Sweeney, is able to get hard an interview with E.J. Dion, who they think is going to be a little more reasonable than some of the other reporters, and Dion keeps pressing him, and it's frustrating for Hart, and Hart's like, what are you really getting at here? What are you really asking me? And, you know, Hart was so frustrated by questions that he would say, name, age, and mama. You know, that, that here he is running for the presidency of the United States, and all people want to ask about is his name change. Uh, his age, because his age had changed on his birth certificate, and and his mother, his relationship with his mother. E.J. Dion, after asking him several questions, mostly about these type of topics, Gary Hart's like, what are you getting at here? And E.J. Dion's like, why do you think we think you're weird? As Sweeney recounted in, in Richard Ben Kramer's book, that was the end of the profile interviews for Gary Hart. He has an announcement way up with overlooking um, with, the, with the Rockies in the background with very few reporters present. He'll have his troubles. Here's how Gail Sheehy describes what happened next with Gary Hart. He accomplished the stunning feat of political self-destruction in only 26 days. Why would any man in his right mind to find a New York Times reporter who had asked about his alleged womanizing to put a tail on me and then cancel his weekend campaign appearances and arrange a tryst? at his Washington townhouse with a Miami party girl. What demon was loose in the 50-year-old frontrunner of the Democratic Party 
who lurched across the charted yacht monkey business drink in hand and boasted to a model friend of Donna Rice's that this was her big chance to party with the next president of the United States. When he was caught off guard and ran, I thought that put an end to my story. Then a debate broke out, adamant that he had in no way transgressed, Hart lashed out at the wrongheadedness and the purience of the press, and stalked off the public stage in anger and defiance. Hart's own divided mind found its analog in defenders within the press who still believe a Chinese wall can exist between public and private selves. So there's a number of reasons I think 1984 is interesting to talk about. And I think it, it's buried in the fact that there was a blowout election. But, you know, there is a what could have been. And, and the Reagan people were, they were particularly afraid of John Glenn running against their man Reagan. But they were also weren't sure about Hart. More afraid of Glenn because they thought they could paint Hart as a liberal. They really liked running against Mondale. As Frank Mekowitz, um, one of Hart's advisors, said, Mondale was easy prey for Reagan. And he was. Labor guy, liberal voting record comes from Minnesota, just not able to get purchase on anything in Reagan. But you wonder what would have happened with a different campaign with a new candidate. And I'll, the other person that wonders about that is Gary Hart himself. Uh, speaking both about his 84 and 88 campaigns that were failures, he, he really, I bear a very heavy burden of responsibility, Hart says. If all of that stuff had not happened, and if I had been elected... There would have been no Gulf War. George H.W. Bush wouldn't have been president, which means George W. Bush wouldn't have been president. Everything would have changed. I don't say that to aggrandize myself. It's just history changed, and that has haunted me for 30 years. I had one talent, and it wasn't traditional politics. I could see further ahead than anybody that things were changing. Well, we never know that. The economy had improved so much. Inflation had had been cut into a third in the early part of Reagan's administration. 1983 and 1984, such good economic years. It is difficult to imagine another candidate winning. So one never knows. I also think 1984 is an interesting election to study because there were a great number of candidates. Campaigning started early. Authenticity became an issue in the race. You also had a president who was a larger-than-life figure, who was very different than people that had been elected before that, who had been a TV star and a movie star. People forget that about Reagan. They, you know, always say movie star. But the reality is most people knew him as a TV, that he would host the GE late-night movie show. So regardless, he was a different type of person. Even though he had served the two terms as governor, he was a very different type of person than your average politician. He engaged in rhetoric that was unfavorable to a lot of Americans. So there are all these things that you see in similarities today. It created a great number of people who wanted to take him on. I think 1984 is interesting because it also shows you how the dynamics of a lot of people running can play out. It's probably a lot of different ways. It's hard to predict. It's multivariate, right? What do you do? For one thing that you notice, where there was present two candidates that were attacking each other, and that's Mondale and Glenn, who thought they would be the front runners, attacking each other. A third candidate rises up, free of attacks. Two things, you know, watch out for that. And if you're the front runner, you might want to spread your attacks a little bit and make sure that there's enough in the public mind with doubts about all of the candidates and not just the one that you're targeting. Because by targeting one, you might be favoring an upstart candidate, as completely happened with, with Gary Hart in Iowa and New Hampshire. So if you're going to do the political algebra to think like who's going to win these contests, you, you have to start thinking about canceling out, like, what candidate is going to be stronger than the other one and cancel them out so that they'll probably be out of the primary soon, so that you get from 25 or 30 to, or, you know, six candidates or something like that. It's not algebra that I would engage in, but it's, it's, it's kind of complicated, but it just, just shows you, a, 1984 gives you a sense of how you have to start to think. This does not mean by any means that I, that I think 2020 goes the way of 1984, but it gives you a sense that even that blowout election wasn't seen that way all the time. doesn't mean that it's going to go this way. Reagan's very different from, from President Trump. Political skills that Trump doesn't have, although Trump has his own social media presence and other things. Hart's surprising win also brings 
a kind, you know, some say, if you listen to like Matt By or the movie The Front Runner with, with Hugh Jackman, you're going to say that, you know, 1984 and that surprise win of Hart, which leads to his surprise front runner status in the next election, is the beginnings of tabloid journalism, where it's like, we've got to investigate this guy. And I think that's quite, all quite interesting. You can't try to run for the whole country in a primary. You run for each state. And I do believe you run a little bit to the left if you're a Democrat, and you run a little bit to the right. This was Nixon's famous statement. You know, run right, in his case in the GOP, run right in the primary, run center in the election. I raised $1.6 million to Mondale's one point two. Polls in July showed me ahead of Reagan, John Glenn says in his memoir. On the advice of my campaign staff, I moved ahead with plans to open offices in most of the country. That, in retrospect, created a false sense of security and pushed me towards organizational mistakes rather than concentrate on traditional battlegrounds. We focused on building a nationwide sensible center. And because I had positions that would appeal to Republicans and Democrats alike, I failed to excite the core constituencies. That's the message from Glenn. So in John Glenn's statement in his memoir about what went wrong in his own presidential campaign, I I think you see something else. When I look at the current uh, primary race and I see something like Biden, I think there's an incredible potential there if he's able to execute that run to the left and then the center movement when it gets the nomination. And he's going nowhere if he can't appeal to those core constituencies, just like Glenn couldn't. Look out for an upstart. I I figure this, you know, um, in Iowa, you're going to see a one, two, three, maybe one, two, three, four. So it's going to be probably Biden and Sanders, and then you're going to see who's going to be three and four, and they're going to get an enlarged amount of momentum and attention. Even though it's the title of this podcast, you know, stop talking about momentum. What Mondale's people were telling the press, you can't do that. Hope you enjoyed the look at the 1984 election. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. A brief word about the extra podcast look it's going. I'll talk a little bit more about the podcasts, how they're made. They provide some extra uh, material that didn't make it into cast and things like that. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com where you can donate. Appendix. From Richard Ben Kramer's What It Takes, The Way to the White House. The first thing you've got to know about Joe is the house. Probably the first thing he'd show you anyway. You talk with Biden about anything. Somehow, it gets back to the home. And the house is gorgeous. An old DuPont mansion. In the DuPont neighborhood, called Greenville, outside Wilmington. It's the kind of place a thousand guys died building, hand-carved doorways, a curving hand-carved grand staircase that Clark Gable could have carried a girl down, a library fit for a Carnegie, or Bernard Baruch, or someone like that, and a ballroom, can't forget the ballroom, and a living room, about half an acre, and a bathroom upstairs the size of a gym, and all dusty rows outside with beautiful brickwork over the windows, black shutters, white porches, a fountain, a pool. The place is drop-dead stately. Joe found it one night, a couple of years after he became a senator. He was driving around like he did back then. He was snooping around Greenville, streets of his dreams, when he saw it all. Overgrown, boarded up. Some developer was going to knock it down because the four and a half acres were worth more than the house. The DuPonts couldn't take care of the place. But Joe had to have a look, and so he pulled in and shinied up a pole in the darkness onto a second floor porch and broke in through the plywood. And when he came out a few minutes later, he had to have it. Joe did a $200,000 deal for the house. That was more than he had, of course. But Biden never let money stand in the way of a deal. He got in the developer's face and started talking fast. Joe can literally talk fast. It's like the stutter left it all pent up. And when he starts talking a deal, he goes a gallop. 
but the beautiful thing in the way he talks deal is the way he talks deal. By the time Joe's finished talking, it wouldn't matter if he didn't have $1,000 cash. In fact, that no one would have any cash for years. When Joe Biden gets going on a deal, he'll talk that deal until it's shimmering before your eyes in God's holy light, like the Taj Mahal. Where do I sign? Anyway, when he moved in, he started finding out about the place. First winter, first three months, he used 3,000 gallons of fuel oil. The top of the house was wide open. Squirrels were living on the third floor. So the second year, he had to get the storm windows for the whole place. Of course, he didn't have the money. So he had to sell off a couple of lots. He lived in fear that the place would need a new 30,000 slate roof. Meanwhile, the place was chock full of asbestos. He had to hire a guy to clean that out. But the guy wanted too much money for labor. So there were weeks when Joe was down in the basement, in a moon suit, ripping out asbestos. When he moved in, the old winding driveway led from Montchon Ave. But Joe couldn't buy all the land that held in the right of way. And when he angered the owner on the front lot, who put boulders in his driveway, so Joe had to build a new one around the front, which was great because everybody who drove in would have to see the whole place. But he didn't have the money to get that paved, so it turned into soup when the weather went bad. And anyway, he sold the corner lot that held the start of the driveway, so he had to build a third driveway, a little one in the back, that he could actually use. But he never liked that dumpy little third one. So eight years later, he made a deal with the new owner of the front lot. It cost him another fortune in landscaping. But he got the original driveway back. He killed one riding mower a year. Biden would let the grass get three feet high until he was going to have someone over or function at the house or something. Then he'd attack it with his riding mower, mower which had been out in the rain for six months. These damn things aren't built right, he'd complain. I gotta find one that works. Upstairs, the third floor was driving him crazy. At one point, he was going to lop off the whole thing. Brought in architects for the plans and everything. Why not? The house, the world, were malleable to his will. Then he decided he'd keep the third floor, but close it off with its own heating plant and a separate entrance. He could rent it. Maybe offices. He'd make a mint. He brought the architects back and a contractor. Then he thought of the strangers around his home. He couldn't stand that. No strangers were going to tromp around his dream world. Next, he envisioned a scheme where he'd take the ballroom, the library, the entry hall, and the carved staircase, the dining room, the living room, and he'd have them disassembled. Then he'd have those rooms reassembled, just like the way they were, in a house that was smaller and new and wouldn't be so hard to run. See? Then he'd stick in wallboard where great rooms had been, and he'd sell the big place. So he brought back all the architects and the contractor, but it was too hard, so he stayed. Meanwhile, he planted. He liked hemlock trees. He found some old Czech. He found some old Czech guy who ran up a, sur- a nursery in Pennsylvania. Joe didn't want any three-foot saplings, no. This guy had big hemlocks. Bushes, great ones. Use big old use. See, Joe had to have privacy. When he started having to sell off lots, he had to plant more because he wanted privacy in his existing lot. When he found this old nursery man, Joe went bananas. Joe kept asking, what's the biggest you've got? 20-foot hemlocks, bushes, huge bushes, a ton of dirt around the bottom of each. His pal Marty was with him one day. Marty Laundergan, a dentist, Joe's buddy from high school. Joe, Marty said, How are we going to get all this back? Get a truck, Joe said. Like everybody's brother had a 40-foot flat foot in the garage. 40-foot flat bed in the garage. Yeah, Marty said. Who's going to drive it? I'll drive, Joe said. Used to drive him all the time. Sure enough, Marty found somebody's brother who'd lend a truck, and Joe drove the thing, overloaded, rocking and pitching with trees hanging off the tail, down the back roads an hour and a half back to Wilmington. Then he started digging, a 45-foot trench, 3 foot deep and 3 feet wide, through blacktop and paving stones. He was out there in gym shorts and hiking boots, sweating like a pig, with the headlights of four cars shining upon his ditch, with Jill leaning out the window to yell, Come to bed, honey! While an old friend or two propped the trees and the bushes up in the ditch, so Joe could wall away his realm. 
No, tighter, Joe would say. I don't know, Joe. Tighter, Joe said. He had to have privacy. The bushes, he planted them two feet apart. Next weekend, he's back for use. He built a wall of use around the swimming pool. Never mind, there was no room for them to spread their roots. What do you think, he asked the nurseryman, grinning. Two years, of course, they'd all be dead. And every time he sold a lot, he needed more trees. And that's as much a license I can feel I can take with the great late Richard Ben Kramer. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please tell someone about it. Thanks so much.